people. While the White House claims its stimulus package is working, the question remains, is it working for all Americans? On this edition, from the bottom line to the unemployment line to the color line. Making Contact brings you this audio version of Link TV and Applied Research Center's video, Color Lines, Race and Economic Recovery, an in-depth video program hosted by Chris Rabb, author of Invisible Capital. I'm Tina Rubio, and this is Making Contact, a program connecting people, battle ideas, and important information. Hello, I'm Chris Rapp, and welcome to Color Lines, Race and Economic Recovery, where we explore the untold stories of how racism hurts all of our economic futures. For the past year, many headlines ask, is the recession over? But for whom? Amidst housing and jobs crash, the media often talked about who stayed above the middle class line. But what we don't see on TV are the people who never had a home or a good job to lose in the first place. These are the millions of poor people whose chance to cross the line into middle class has always been cut short by another kind of line, the color line. Today we look at some of the biggest problems that racial inequity has created, especially for the poor. We'll also suggest some promising solutions. In our first story, we go to Hartford, Connecticut and meet Tisha Davis, a 29-year-old black woman and mother of three. Despite the failure of systems to provide education, employment, or even safety for her family, Tish is surviving, but not by much. I got a job, my first job when I was 16. And since then, I would work. I just felt like I could just do it my own self. I wanted to be able to do it for my own self. Meet Tisha, a lifelong Hartford resident and a mother of three who's tried to do everything right for her kids. They've never been without food. Um, they've never been without lights that, you know, they know of. So, Jordan, you had a good day today? Tish is an experienced home health care worker, but she's struggled to find work in recent years. And being a single mother is a full-time job without pay. They're depending on me. For me to not be able to provide for them the way that they should be provided for um, would mean basically that I failed them. Tisha turned to Connecticut's public assistance program for help getting back on her feet. However, she found that the daily schedule of a single mom made employment both vital and impossible. The Department of Labor, if through the Jobs First Employment Services Program, Jane McNichol, Legal Assistance Resource Center of Connecticut, uh, evaluates what barriers families are facing as they come into the program. Immediately start with child care and transportation as barriers. And then you go on to you know, limited uh, education, limited job skills. These are not barriers that are easily overcome in 21 to 33 months. People on cash assistance absolutely agree. They would rather be working than, um, than getting cash assistance. But at a time when there's a whole lot of competition for jobs, all of these barriers become much bigger. In order to keep receiving the benefits from the state, I had to go, like Monday through Friday, for workshops that they had. And sometimes I'd be there as early as 8.30 and wouldn't be able to leave until 3.30. I honestly felt like they were a bit time-wasting, you know, just for me personally, because these were things that I felt like I already knew how to do. Remember, Tish has been working since her teens and is already a trained CNA worker. But instead of finding her jobs in her field or hiring her outright, the taxpayer-funded program had Tisha take classes like... How to go for an interview, how to look for a job, how to do the follow-up about the job. Instead of just the workshops, they should have been saying, hey, we have training that we will pay for. You know, if you come and do these trainings, we'll, we'll assist you. Yet a more effective jobs program would still be a struggle because Connecticut time limits their public assistance. People run out of um, both cash assistance and this vouchered assistance um, fairly quickly and before they've been able to put together the skills and, and uh, the training they need to actually get jobs. Time limits are a huge problem for that. And if people find some work, all assistance is taken away putting them right back where they started. If you get a job and you're earning basically $90 more than what you were getting on benefits, um, you lose all those benefits. So it's, it's known as the cliff effect and it's something that um, people have looked at over the years and, and thought about wanting to change but haven't actually 
done it. Jobs still aren't calling back, and I don't know if it's they're not calling back because we don't specifically have the skills or if it's because other people that have more qualifications are getting the jobs. But I just feel like with the workshops and things, like they really motivate you, you know, that once we finish with these workshops, you know, we will find a job. Not one time did I get a job through them. Put it in a toy. A lot of times I say to my daughter, we can't do X, Y, and Z because, you know, mommy doesn't have money for that. We're poor. And she'll laugh, you know, we're not poor, you know. And I say, I'm happy that you think that because I don't want for you guys to stress, you know, about the things I stress day to day about, but we live paycheck to paycheck. Come on, Ben. Ben, I pick up something, you have to eat the seven, whatever you drop, pick your seven dogs. So what happened to the safety net? Ronald Reagan started chipping away at the safety net in the 1980s. Reagan blamed poor people for causing their own poverty and said that the government is not the solution. The myth of the so-called welfare queen and its subtle racist appeal made it easier to blame the victim and helped pass Clinton's Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Act in 1996. But that law's focus on behavior failed to lift women out of poverty. Many were forced into low-wage work that didn't pay enough to support their families and rarely supplied benefits. Meanwhile, welfare programs did not guarantee child care or transportation assistance, let alone access to a good job, leaving women of color to fend for themselves. As the result of demonizing women of color, the safety net was diminished for everyone. Trinity College professor Vijay Prashad. It doesn't work so easily to sell an anti-welfare policy by saying that, you know, a white mother is going to no longer get a check to raise her children. I mean, given the simple brass ring of racism, politicians reached for it. You can say there is a black woman, she's having so many children, she's on welfare, and then people say, well, then she doesn't deserve it, we should stop giving welfare. All these attempts of um, welfare to work, you know, how can there be welfare to work when there were no jobs that were of a substantial, uh, you know, a character? Jobs that were able to provide wages with benefits that allowed these women particularly to take care of children, to take care of elders. This was a facade. How can somebody have a career if they have to leave their job at 2.30 to pick up their kid? He wants to do things, but he gets frustrated. If he can't do it, he gets very frustrated. And I, I just don't want him to slide through the cracks and they don't pay attention to him. They just push him off like, okay, he's just a bad kid. Come on, say I don't think he is. Not just because he's my child, you know. They had a tutoring service last year in the school. I guess they didn't have enough funds, so the tutoring is out. Steve Thornton, SEIU 1199. The jobs people used to be able to count on the, the one job per family that would provide for a house and food and security, those are disappearing. Hartford was once a booming town. So what happened? People who owned these factories realized it was cheaper to own them in either other parts of the country, like the South, or completely out of the country. At that point, Hartford manufacturers decided to pack up and leave. African-American families during World War II could find relatively less discrimination and Jim Crow and more opportunity because the jobs were here. As the jobs left, they were stuck here. There are all kinds of new healthcare jobs that are not unionized. That's absolutely true. And um, frankly, I don't know what you do if you're stuck in a low-wage job. And since there really isn't the same safety net, you've got nowhere else to go except maybe your family. Thank you. I missed some appointments down with the state and they wanted to know why did I miss these appointments because they were going to cut me off and then I had to explain to one of the ladies that I felt comfortable talking to that I was in a domestic violence situation and um, 
some days that I wouldn't feel comfortable to leave out the house. I had to bring her proof that, you know, we had actually police reports, you know, restraining orders that I was going through the process. Women in poverty have an astoundingly high rate of um, domestic violence. And Jane McNichol. when there aren't other alternatives, you do put women in the, in the position of having to accept, um, you know, sort of having no real choices. So it's, it's just one and, and one of the worst of the difficult choices that we present to people by not providing them with, um, with support. I wasn't able to maintain to take care of myself and Shamira. So, you know, my, I felt like my only option was to be back with her father because I honestly felt like what else was I to do? Um, and a lot of people look and they say, you know, there's other options, but I honestly felt like I had no other option. I know that he will be able to help with the bills. Um, I moved out from the apartment and just moved back home with my mother. But then the house was so old, like it was built before a certain year, so like the paint that they painted with. Once my son was born, they said that he had a high count of lead. They told me I had to find a place. And if I didn't find a place, that they were going to take the kids because I wasn't providing a safe environment. So then that's when I started checking out about Section 8. Unlike most applicants, Tisha was lucky enough to get into Hartford's public housing program, but found that its neighborhoods had dangers of their own. Once we moved in, it was a different atmosphere. Ty Ty got really scared after one night. Um, some people were shooting outside, and it sounded like it was so close. So, like, you know, we were, like, on the floor for, like, a good portion of the night. I made pallets and we just stayed on the floor. The only reason I moved to this apartment is to still be with them for, you know, DCF not to take them. I just feel like a lot of stuff that they have for people that are not rich or um, above poverty. Um, I feel like sometimes they subject us to things that are below ourselves. We just go to those neighborhoods that are in that book. I don't think that they would keep that system going, you know? Like, I feel like it's not places that they would go to live with their family. And I feel like nobody else should get something less just because, okay, I don't have a degree. I, didn't, I wasn't able to go to college. So I don't have a degree. You know, it doesn't mean that I don't want the same things that you want for your family. You know what I mean? Today, Tisha is timed off with public assistance and still struggles to pay the bills with her 16-hour-a-week job on the far side of town. She and her kids have been surviving as best they can on a support system stigmatized to death. As she's worked to become self-sufficient, it hasn't helped nearly enough. So what can change for Tisha and for the women and families like her? I think there has to be a different priority for our entire economic and political system. And Steve Thornton. And uh, I think the only people who are actually going to be able to bring that change about are the people who are most affected. I don't think legislators will do it uh, unless they're pushed. And um, I don't think that community leaders or elected uh, officials will do it unless there's a movement behind it. Can you visualize if uh, abandoned property is made into a crash, into a daycare center? You know, what a beautiful thing for, you know, the women raising their children. Then they would get time to do other things, you know, to live a life, you know. Uh, why should we say that, well, you know, it's a mother, she should just raise her children. She may have other aspirations as well. And what does Tisha want for her own future? I probably still want to do the CNA work. Um, I just, I like working with the elderly people and just being able to help someone gives me a sense of, um, I don't know. Um, but I will definitely want a 40-hour position job. Um, maybe getting $15 an hour, um, you know, with health benefits, medical, for me and the kids. Honestly, I feel like the kids are the reason that I try so hard um, to keep going every day, you know, for the kids to be able to go out and play. That's it. Color Lines, Race and Economic Recovery is a co-production of Link TV and the Applied Research Center. To watch the video online, you can go to linktv.org or colorlines.com. We'll be right back. You're listening to Making Contact. 
a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or for CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. We now return to Color Lines, Race and Economic Recovery, a co-production of Link TV and the Applied Research Center. Hello and welcome back to Color Lines, Race and Economic Recovery. The precarious situation we just saw Tisha living in is sadly one of the better outcomes of the safety net that's been shredded. If economic recovery leaves out communities of color, then families like Tisha's will be kept in the shadows, their dreams deferred, and they deserve better. Here with us to help put that last story into context is Tram Nguyen, author and journalist who has written extensively on racial justice issues. Tram is former editor of Color Lines magazine and now works at the California Reinvestment Coalition. Welcome. Thanks, Chris. It's great to be here. So we just saw this heart-wrenching story about Tisha and her struggles. With this economic crisis uh, that's impacting everyone, why is it important to highlight race in looking at the aftermath of the Great Recession? Well, first of all, race is important because when you have an economic system that's already built on inequities and then a crisis like this hits, what you have is, you know, the communities that were left out fall through the cracks faster and harder than everyone else. So while well, you know, we do have 10% unemployment across the board nationally within communities of color, it's not a recession, it's a depression. With African Americans, the jobless rate is 15%, and among Latinos, it's 13%, and then also looking at single mothers, it's 13% unemployment. So what it shows us is that where the safety net and where the economic system has been failing, it fails even worse among communities that have been left out. So is this the reason why you segment out unemployment rates based on different communities? So why it matters that we break this out across race is that not only it shows us where the recession is really hitting harder and deeper and communities that really need more help, but also that it tells us how to design solutions that actually get to solving inequalities. We've seen that the Great Recession has laid bare systemic problems that are impacting everyone, but these systems also impact racial inequality in other ways that maybe for the first time a broad swath of Americans can acknowledge. With this uh, great recession, what we've had is a financial collapse and then a mass transfer of public wealth to the tune of $700 billion that went to Wall Street and the banks. And on the other hand, we're demonizing social safety net programs like food stamps that now serve one in eight Americans. Wow. That's an amazing, that's a staggering number. Coming back to your question, Chris, about why is race important? You know, the flip side of that is that racism is used to divide us and distract us from looking at uh, solutions that would actually fix the economy for everyone. So, uh, for instance, you know, uh, poor people are often demonized, uh, stereotyped as, you know, being black or brown typically or, you know, criminal or undeserving of help without keeping an eye towards where the racial fault lines show, then we can't design solutions that actually address that and get to actually fixing the inequality. So for instance, for a woman of color, a lot of the barriers start with child care, having affordable access to child care. And so if you don't keep that in mind in designing a policy solution, then you don't come up with something where you, know, you can, as a single mother, go back to work. Thank you. We've heard how the economy and the safety net are still looking pretty hopeless for so many, especially people of color. Our next story is about an exciting way people are trying to put hope back on track. After his election, President Obama promised to create 5 million new green jobs paid from the stimulus money. But if green jobs are good jobs by design, will they reach the folks who need it the most? Let's take a peek at how in California, communities are making local government build fairness and inclusion into new city projects in green retrofit and solar. The green economy is growing. A new job sector built on earth-friendly technologies such as solar power and energy efficiency. The Recovery Act has put $200 billion towards green jobs to save the environment and to stimulate the economy. But whose economy is really being stimulated? 
Unfortunately, there's not a lot of good employment in, in our communities. There's not a lot of opportunities for job training to have a good career. Right now, there's no guarantee that green jobs will go to communities that were hit the hardest. Less than 30% of green jobs are held by black and Latino workers, and barely 3% of energy sector jobs are held by women of color. There are well-meaning people in city government like myself. Eric Marr, San Francisco Board of Supervisors. But there really aren't any concrete, specific equity goals. Decisions are made often without any input from the communities that are most impacted. In the spring of 2009, an alliance of community and statewide groups worked with the city of Los Angeles to pass a green retrofit ordinance. Soon, city buildings will get energy-saving upgrades done by locals who are trained and hired at fair wages. Manuel Hernandez. Scope LA. There's going to be an opportunity to men and women. It took several individuals to install these solar panels. It took someone to design where the so solar panels were going to be installed. It's going to take someone to maintain the solar panels. And that just translates into jobs and job creation. We have a membership base of mostly African American and Latino uh, families who live in South Los Angeles. Elsa Barbosa, Scope LA campaign director. We're fighting for systemic change to create good quality jobs, training, and investment in our community and in our city. I have to give credit to what credit is due. Herb Wesson, LA City Council. It was the individuals from Scope Agenda who came to me with this idea. The thing that really makes this important is that we would engage and train community people. Kevin Norton, IBEW Local 11. Most green jobs, like solar power, have between a 30 and 50 percent public subsidy. We think there's no reason that they shouldn't be a good job. When we think about sustainability, really what we're saying is... Dr. Manuel Pastor, How can USC. we make sure that this world is left in good shape? Sustainability demands that we do something about the planet, but sustainability demands that we do something about these conditions in urban America that are so distressed. The Scope LA Green Jobs Ordinance is part of a growing trend in California. The city of Oakland created a green jobs training program, graduating its first class in 2009. Art Shanks. Cypress Mandela Training Center. So the Oakland Green Jobs Corps, we launched from here back in October of 08 with the mayor, with Grove Sector, the Ella Baker Center, and Laney College. And we put this partnership together to make sure that Oakland residents had a segue into the solar industry. So it's definitely give me a leg up and give me a better future, I think. Talking to the community about what we would like the definition of a green job to be, um, rather for someone else in the private industry defining green jobs for our communities. This is the starting point. Our idea is to connect all of the dots. Oakland Mayor Ron Dellum. Families can get low interest or no interest loans in order to weatherize their homes, which will create more employment so these people will have more jobs. My kids are interested in what John I'm doing. Tafoya. Cypress Mandela Training Center graduate. I think they're really excited that I have a job, period, because I've been without one for a while. But um, mostly they're just proud of me that I, that I found a job in this tough economy that I really enjoy, and, and they're excited for me. A lot of satisfaction watching a job from beginning to end come together. The full impact of the green economy remains to be seen. But where fairness is built into green jobs creation, we see lives being changed already. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to take what I've learned and I'm ready to do it. We're back with Tram Nguyen. So Tram, are green jobs a silver bullet for communities of color? Well, I think we have to look at it this way, that our communities have been stripped of jobs, stripped of wealth. And, you know, there's been a long time uh, disinvestment um, with, you know, jobs outsourced, uh, jobs, you know, dying and right. being lost. And so um, what we need is to make sure that, you know, uh, people are put back to work in rebuilding their communities in retrofitting these homes or, um, you know, rebuilding the transit infrastructure and that these jobs are actually accessible to people um, to be trained for them right. and to be hired for them. Right. So to do that, I don't think it's a silver bullet and it's a given. Well, 
I agree we can really be inspired by a lot of these local initiatives. Uh, we need more, and part of that is federal policy and state policy to make sure that not only we create green jobs in and for local communities, we also build a greater platform of sustainability that includes entrepreneurship and social enterprises that benefit the community at large. Because ultimately what we need is greater community wealth in communities of color. I know that in the African American community, certainly before the Great Recession, we had one-tenth of the wealth of our white counterparts. That's our equity in our homes, our investments, retirement, all of those assets. You Put, put them all together, one-tenth of our white counterparts, even when you control for socioeconomic class. And that has a devastating impact on a lot of communities of color. So I think now we have an opportunity to really have a mandate to make sure that these issues get addressed and that we build meaningful uh, civic governmental collaborations that promote the, the benefit of whole communities. That's right, Chris. It's about putting people back to work and rebuilding communities. So we just saw a very compelling uh, example of community-inspired green jobs creation. What's the takeaway from this story? I think this story is so important, Chris, because it does show that uh, community-led solutions work and that without that, you don't get the solutions that actually really address the needs in a community. So take, for instance, Oakland, where I live and work. Uh, we have been involved, a lot of community groups here, in trying to shape and be part of decisions on redeveloping transit hubs, for instance. So making sure that train stations, as they're being redeveloped, have more housing and more use and reduce car usage, that uh, that doesn't displace the local communities. And that, you know, housing that's being built there is actually affordable and accessible to local residents. And that the housing uh, creates jobs that, you know, are being trained and hired locally as well. And so to have the community groups be uh, part of the decision making, part of the shaping of these solutions, guarantees that the green economy is equitable. So thank you very much for joining us, Tram. Thanks, Chris. Deep cuts to social programs and the lack of good jobs and wealth building opportunities have set up communities of color to fail. When poverty and racial inequity are structured into the economy, it hurts almost everyone in serious ways. But like the more equitable green jobs programs in Los Angeles and Oakland have shown us, if we put fairness and opportunity front and center in the recovery plans, we can all win and share the benefits. The time is now to start building. That's it for this edition of Making Contact. Colorline's Race and Economic Recovery is a co-production of Link TV and the Applied Research Center. Research assistance for this Color Lines program was provided by the Investigative Fund at the Nation Institute and major funding by the Akhenati Foundation. Color Lines host, Chris Rabb, author of Invisible Capital. Erica Marcus, executive producer. Tammy Johnson, Marin Matthew, Noel Rabinowitz, co-producers. Edited by Channing Kennedy. The Color Lines program was produced and written by Chris Rabb, Tammy Johnson, Noel Rabinowitz, and Channing Kennedy. Check out our website at radioproject.org to get our podcast, download past shows, or help make a difference by supporting our work. Thanks for listening to Making Contact. The Jewish Music Festival celebrates 25 years, March 20th to 29th, Part 1 in Berkeley. Highlights include sacred Jewish and Muslim music of the Middle East, a Grammy-winning vocal mix of Irish Jewish musical magic, and Diaspora Redux, a brilliant setet from New York, Berlin, and Buenos Aires. Tickets begin at $10 at jewishmusicfestival.org or 800-838-3006. That's jewishmusicfestival.org or 800-838-3006. This program benefits the Jewish Community Center of the East Bay.
And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno and online at kpfa.org. It's just about 2 